To few people in a lifetime comes the chance of seeing such a gigantic blaze as the funeral pyre of the Crystal Palace, the proudest building of the last century, one of the few remaining links with Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Built in 1851 in Hyde Park for the Great Exhibition, opened in royal state by the Queen and the Prince Concert, it was later transferred to its present site in what was then the rural outskirts of London. In 1913 it became the property of the nation, was used as a naval training school during the war, and reopened to the public by their majesties King George and Queen Mary 16 years ago. It was once spoken of by Thackeray as a blazing arch of lucid glass, and that description was never truer than tonight. At about eight o'clock the fire started at the Sydenham end. Within five minutes it was blazing. The palace firemen did what they could, but it was obviously hopeless, and all the might of London's firefighting equipment can do little more than delay the inevitable destruction. Everything is against them. Across the high ground the wind blows freshly from the northwest, driving the flames before it. Firemen work unceasingly, miles of hose are unreal, water towers go up, high pressure pumps roar, but all in vain, the palace is doomed. As the great glow lights the evening sky, every available means of transport brings the watchers in their tens of thousands. And is it worth it? Flames roaring up 150 feet, such heat that people in neighboring houses are unable to look out of their windows. Masses of molten glass pouring down continuously. Crystal Palace, where brass bands used to play and stone figures turned a deaf ear, stages its most amazing spectacle when fire sets the scene of the biggest London blaze since 1892. For 82 years, the glittering edifice has stood a famous landmark on Norwood Ridge. Ever since, in fact, it was transported from Hyde Park, where it stood for the Great International Exhibition of 1851. Now.
I'm standing in the middle of the A212. Crystal Palace over there, Sydney is down there. But beneath my feet, right here, right now, is the Crystal Palace subway. The Crystal Palace subway is an abandoned Victorian construction that used to link the old Crystal Palace railway station to the great exhibition of the same name. Usually locked, but sometimes opened up during open house weekend, we got to have a look around the site with the treasurer of the Friends of Crystal Palace subway, who want to see this space reopened. Watch your head. So this would have been glass roofed, and this would have taken you up into the Crystal Palace. And this is actually the most dangerous. This is why you need these. So this is being surveyed. This is all quite poor condition. They're coming through. They are leaning, leaning in, yeah. So this is on the Heritage at Risk Register, okay. with English Heritage, and they're currently done a survey and they're trying to get it off the Heritage at Risk Register. The friends are raising funds to make the area safe, but not this outside part though, no. The cool part is the bit that sits directly underneath the road. There's a rumour that it was built by Italian cathedral makers, which has not been proven. It's not been proven at all. We, did, uh, we were very fortunate to get Heritage Lottery funding to research the history of the subway a couple of years ago. Um, and lots of things we discovered have changed people's sort of previous knowledge of it. The architect is not who everybody thought it was, and we haven't proven that it's Italian cathedral makers. Are these old light fittings? Gas, yep, they would have been gas. There was gas lighting? Yep. So at the moment, no services at all to the subway. It is as you see it but it was originally gas lighted and it, it was used as an air raid shelter during the war, so it would have had lighting at that point. As well as the people that slept here during the war, it was still open in the 1960s for people to come in and explore, and was even used up to the late 1980s with even a music video being shot here. All a far cry from the time when it originally opened in the 19th century. Various people saw this. Paxton is our man who saved the day. Now, Joseph Paxton was in fact the head gardener to the Duke of Devonshire at Chatsworth. And for him, he had already built several glass houses. The earliest one was in 1833. He built another one for him in 34, a much bigger one called the Great Stove, which is started in 36, and finally one in 1848. And he uses the systems of the architecture, wooden sash bars, ridge and furrow glazing, that is angled glass that in the morning the sun can go through, the afternoon go through, but otherwise it's quite sharp and bounces the light off, and cast iron columns which act as hollow drain pipes. Therefore, Paxton thought he had a kit of parts that was better than anything that he'd seen. The basis for the columns. The size of the building plot is... 1,848 by 408 feet, that is 563 by 124 metres. This is four times the size of St Paul's Cathedral, enough to cover Birmingham's International Convention Centre and Symphony Hall and the square beyond in front of the Repertory Theatre and the recently demolished library and the council house, all covered under that one building. So this is a very, very large building indeed. Now think of this, 3,230 columns, 2,300 girders. The first one went up on the 26th of September. They've only been on site a few weeks. By this time, there are 400 men working on the site. A month later, the workforce had risen to 1,500. And before the end of the year, there were 2,260. Everything was tested before it was assembled. They had testing rigs for the columns and for the beams. And advanced tests were done about the weights that the beams would stand, the weights that the floors would stand, and so on. This is a giant greenhouse. Victorians wore a lot of clothes. So to cut down the heat and also some of the glare, all the glazing that was vertical on the front of the building, that is facing south, was panelled in wood. In other words, it wasn't glazing, it was solid. And all the flat roofs were covered on the exterior with canvas sheeting. And that then made the whole thing slightly more bearable. The exhibition building with a central transept. So it's basically cross-shaped, but it's very long on the axis. And half the building is going to be dedicated to Britain and its dominions, and the other half of the building to the rest of the world. In 1851, that's a fair distribution of the 
industrialised opportunity for exhibits. So that became the home to the second London International Exhibition of 1862 on the site of what's now the Natural History Museum. It became the home of the Victorian Albert Museum, the Science Museum, the Geological Museum, Imperial College, the Royal College of Music, and various other ones. Oh, and a little thing called the Albert Hall, all on that site, all from the profit of the exhibition. So we have lots of legacies. One of the most interesting ones, perhaps, is excursion travel and also the idea of differential prices, that you can pay higher prices for a sort of more exclusive visit. The Crystal Palace was designed by Joseph Paxton, who is quite the gardener, and has over 900,000 square feet of glass. I mean, come on, isn't that reason enough to come see it? No? Well, how about the fact that we have the first installation of public toilets? That's right. For just a single pence, you can come flush a toilet instead of using the wall. It's not a bad deal, huh? And what about those of you that were just like Paxton and you enjoy gardening? Do you like fountains? Guess what? We have fountains. We have fountains on top of fountains on top of fountains. Because guess what? We're British and we like our fountains. Of course, we did have a problem with the water supply for a bit there, but we've since fixed that. We got the Queen a bit wet too, and she was real mad about that one for a while, but I think we smooth things over with her. For those of you that are actually here for the exhibits, we've got a lot, not just from Britain, but we also have them from the colonies and dependencies and the 44 foreign states in Europe and the Americas. There's over 13,000 in total. And the exhibits include a wide variety of things. We have an envelope maker machine, we've got a kitchen appliances section, a steel making display, a reaping machine that was sent in from the United States. We have something that's a precursor to the modern fax machine.